Hello everyone and welcome back to the 3T Path channel. My name is Giri Daridas and today I want to tell you about a fascinating archaeological discovery which was the discovery of the lost gospel of Judas. So this is a one of a kind, a single copy found and this text dated from 1700 years ago. But the actual text, I mean the, the text, the book they found was from 1700 years ago, but the actual text goes back even further and they think it was written around the year 180. So this is, goes way far back in the story of Christianity. And this is a fascinating thing. It's the Gospel of Judas, right? The, 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 the official um, you know, Christian church version of Judas, that's the version of the Roman Catholic Church. That's the idea that Judas, of course, is the betrayer, the enemy. So how could there be a gospel by Judas written by Judas? And this is a fascinating concept. So let's talk about that here and the fascinating parallels of that gospel with the Bhagavad Gita. That's what I want to bring to you here today. So anyway, so this is a it was this text was uncovered in the 1970s and again it is the only copy there's only just one one of these were ever found so this was found in the 1970s it was a huge it's a great story like I was found and the and people trying to like sell it and get a good price for it and and scholars analyzing it you know in detail for years and years and they did carbon dating on the paper and so from the carbon dating they saw that it, the book was actually it was written in the year 300 but the same text was mentioned by another um, church uh, scholar in before the year 180 so it was mentioned by a it's in another text there's a mention of this book which was never found before. So they know that it's actually from at least, um, you know, from before the year 180. Just to get you a bearing, you know, the book of, you know, the Gospel of John was written around the year 90. So this is, you know, quite close to the, to the, to the dates of the oldest books that we have in the present Bible. Anyway, so in this book, Judas is not the betrayer, but actually he's the only true disciple. And this is how it works out. This book has a kind of a Gnostic um, vibe to it. And I've talked about this before here in this channel and you, if you haven't looked into it, you should because it's a fascinating topic. So there were these Gnostic Christian, Christian traditions way back then. Of course, they were all kind of like you know, beaten out of the of the market by the what became later the Roman Catholic Church. You know, like the orth. You know, they they like, no, this is, we've got the right idea. You guys have the wrong idea. So they kind of gradually like, um, you know, like knocked out all the competition from the market. But in the beginning, there were all these, of course, these different um, um, Christian ideas, very different views of what Christ was, of, of his teachings, very, completely like very different, like a different religion, really, but based on, 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 on Jesus Christ. And so one like huge branch of these is the Gnostics. And the Gnostics, they had this, they had different ideas, but the basic idea they had was that there was the need for knowledge. And this is going to be a topic in this in this gospel, there was a need for knowledge to become liberated. And what Jesus had done was he brought knowledge. And with this knowledge, you could then become spiritually liberated. So we're going to talk about that in relation to um, the Gita as well. So anyway, so Judas isn't the betrayer, but he's actually the only one who really understands Jesus. And why is he so important? Because didn't he... Wasn't Judas the one that led to Jesus' death? Yes, but actually that was the plan. And when you think about it, 
you know, that must have been the plan, right? If Jesus hadn't died, then where would Christianity be? There wouldn't be any Christianity, practically speaking, if you didn't have that whole concept of, of dying on the cross. That was, what would you have, right? That's, that's even, the, even the Orthodox, the Roman Catholic version, is completely based on that event. So, who led that event to happen, then, of course, he must be the most important person. But in this Gospel of Judas, uh, it's even, it's quite different. It's not even just because he needed, you know, the, to die on the cross. It's actually, the death isn't important at all. The idea uh, portrayed in this Gospel of Judas is that Christ was this special being that was sent from the highest realm. So in the in this Gnostic traditions, you have these very complicated presentations of you know the cosmology of the of existence, as it were. And so you have these highest realms of divinity of God. And from these highest realms of God, um, by mistake, something came out of that realm, some divine spark came out of that highest realm. And that generated the creator God of the Bible. So, that, so this whole material creation was a mistake by this kind of an evil God. So like a, like a fallen God, as it were. So it was a, you know, it's, it's not the real thing, not the, the ultimate realm. But Christ was this being sent from this ultimate realm and then he entered into the body of Jesus. So they have this thing, which, was, which became one of the things the Catholic Church um, fought against, this concept of um, the, two, the two things, like a, a Christ within a Jesus body. So like a divine um, being within a regular human. So like the Jesus regular human, and then this Christ is this special being. But in this Gospel of Judas, that's what you have. You have this Christ being coming from the highest realms of divinity who enters into this mortal shell of the body of this, you know, Jewish person called Jesus. And then he's preaching, he's doing that, he's using this body to give people the knowledge they need, the gnosis, the, the knowledge they need to become liberated. So he's bringing this secret spiritual knowledge, what the Gnostic, the whole, like, you know, the common ground of all the Gnostic traditions, like Gnostic knowledge. You need to have this special knowledge to get out. So then, because he was there, he needed the death of that body to get out and go back to home, go back to his divine realm. And, and, and Judas was the one who could recognize him. He knew that he had to get out of the body, so he needed to like figure out a way to, to get the body killed so that he could leave, so the real Christ could leave. So in this case, in, this, in all these Gnostic um, Gospels, these different Gnostic traditions that arose around Jesus, being you know, the, the, the dying was completely not important. Jesus dying on the cross, which became, of course, the central concept for, for Paul and for the whole Roman Catholic Church and for Christians these days, that was completely unimportant because it's like, that's just the death. It's completely not the point. The point was the knowledge that Jesus was giving, while, well, you know, that Christ was giving within the body of Jesus while he was here. And Judas recognized that and then helped him to finish his mission here and get out and go back to his divine realm. And, and in this text, of course, Jesus is saying to Judas, you're the, one, you're the only one who gets it. You're the only one who understands because you have this ability. So what else do we have here? So the idea here in this um, Gospel of Judas is that you have the world is evil. Like I said, the world is an is a evil creation of this creator God of the Bible. So they had this idea that the, you know, the, the, the God in the Bible, the Old Testament, of course, in the end, it had, you know, they didn't have the, the New Testament then. So the, you know, the Jewish Bible, 
the, the, the creator God, Elohim. So that God, he was actually an evil God. Because, and you know, they, they figure this out because there's so much suffering. Material life is so hard. There's so much suffering here. It's just such a struggle. And you see all these horrible people in power. And they had this, you know, we, we complain about uh, leaders and the billionaires today, but they were complaining about them, you know, 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. I thought it, it, it's always been a thing. So people look and say, like, oh, these horrible people are in charge, you know? And these horrible, like, they get invaded, people invade horrible invaders, and, and the kings are always horrible. It's like, it's like the people in charge are awful. There's so much suffering, there's so much injustice. So, so they're like, no, this is, this is a big myth. This is obviously a created by an evil god. And actually, you know, Jesus was actually preaching that. We know historically, it's something like, you know, within, it's a fact that Jesus was preaching like, that this world was completely dominated by this evil and that God was going to come and reset the whole thing and establish the kingdom of God. So he didn't think, so, you know, that's, that's actually in the New Testament. You can see that. So he did have this concept. So you can see, like, why there were all these different lines of Christianity because Jesus did actually teach these things that this has been taken over. All the apocalyptic Jews, they believe this, this, the world has just been taken over by evil. Evil's in charge, not God. And so God is going to just, you know, but this is coming to an end. They thought it was going to come to an imminent end. And so Jesus was, you can see that in the New Testament several times. Jesus said, no, it's going to happen within your lifetimes, within this generation. This is going to happen. Some of you won't see death before this happens. They really thought it was going to happen right away. And then when it didn't, they had to kind of change, you know, like post death of Jesus, they kind of have to change the theology of it. And you can see that in the, in the New Testament, you can see that as it gets changed, when you get to the latest Gospels, like the Gospel of John, they never really changed the theology a bit. It's like, no, 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 it's something else. But, but actually, what, that's what Jesus was actually teaching and believed, was that the world was taken over by evil. And that's why he says, you know, those who are high are going to be low, the meek shall inherit the earth. Because if you're, if you're at the top and the world is evil, then you're evil. And if you're at the bottom in an evil world, then you're good. So that was this whole concept of, you know, like uh, the, the, the meek shall inherit the earth and the poor will be rich and those who aren't suffering will, will have joy. And, and those who, who have everything going well, they're going to suffer because it was this inversion because this world is, is evil and then God's going to come and actually set up the real kingdom of God. So similar idea, but so the creator God of the Bible is evil. This is in the Gospel of Judas, it's like it's, it's, it's openly declared like that. And it's the creation of fallen divine creatures, far away removed from the true spiritual realm. So this is interesting. So let's start comparing it a little bit here. In the Vedas, we have a very interesting concept where God isn't the creator. We don't have this concept of God the creator in the Vedas. What we have is God empowering this other being called Lord Brahma. And you can see that there's a Trimurti video about Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. There's a link to it here in the description of the video so you can understand a little more about this. But so God empowers this other being, Lord Brahma, to then do the creation because he doesn't actually get involved with creation because it is like, you know, it is a a bit of a scary place, the whole material. He doesn't get involved in actually creating this. So he gives this um, to Lord Brahma. Now, and Krishna also says this, look at this verse from um, chapter 15, uh, sorry, chapter 8, verse 15. Krishna says like this, reaching me, great souls, never return to birth in this transient realm of sorrow, for they have gone to final perfection. So this idea that this world is an ocean of miseries, is a, a transient realm of sorrow. It's right there in the Bhagavad Gita. It's also, they have this similar concept that, yes, this is, this is not a nice place. Don't try to make this, you know, like, don't think you're going to be in heaven you're going to create a heavenly situation here on earth. You won't. This is a place of suffering. 
So there's this similar idea. So what you have to do is you have to go out. If you have to get out. In the, the, in the Gospel of Judas, you have the same concept. Look, like you get out. In, in, the, in the Orthodox Roman Catholic idea, it was like, no, no. Well, you know, they all said this, yeah, now I'm going back home. But Jesus thought, no, no, God is going to come down and make this a nice place. But that didn't happen, so then they changed it. You're going to have to go back to God's place, because this is not a nice place. Now, second point, it's really important. The whole central concept of the Gospel of Judas and other Gnostic Gospels. You need knowledge, gnosis. Look at the word gnosis. Gyan, very similar. They have the same root. Gyana gnosis. So, and of course, in modern English, we say ignorant. Gno, the, the ignorant is from gnosis, knowledge. So, gyana. So, you need special knowledge. You need gyana to understand your true nature, the true nature of the world, and the true nature of God. To be released. So that's the whole central point of the Gospel of Jesus and these other Gnostic Gospels of Christian, Gnostic Christian Gospels. Same idea that, like the Gospel of Thomas, for example, that you have to get this special knowledge, and Jesus came to give this special knowledge, and then you can take that knowledge and then you can become liberated. And of course, in the whole um, yoga, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna teachings concept. This is a central idea. Krishna says it over and over again. For example, check out this verse, verse 9 of chapter 4 of Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, One who thus knows in truth my divine birth and deeds never again takes birth upon giving up the body but comes to me, Arjuna. So Krishna says, this is chapter 4 of Bhagavad Gita, is dedicated to Jnana Yoga. So one of, you know, Jnana Yoga, the path of connecting, of spiritual connection through knowledge, Jnana Yoga. And he says, if you know me, if you understand, you know, because Krishna is speaking to Arjuna, if you understand me, my activities and my deeds, you won't take birth again, but you'll come to me, Arjuna. So that's the same idea. Knowledge will liberate you. This is a central concept of Bhagavad Gita, of the whole spiritual Vedic path. Central concept, exactly the same as the Gnostic idea in the Gospel of Judas. One more point, in, which is emphasized about how special Judas is, because they explain that not all humans have what it takes. Only special ones like Judas. So they had this idea that not all, in the Gnostic Gospels, not all humans have what it takes to be able to live. Because they didn't, they didn't really talk about you know, reincarnation. As they just talked about like you know, this life. So not everybody had the spark of divinity in them that could be that could be triggered, that, could, that knowledge could trigger their liberation. Some people were just destined to stay here. So they had this idea. Of course, in the Bhagavad Gita, it's a little more um, uh, accessible to everyone. Everyone has a chance, but not everyone gets it. Look at this verse. This is verse 3 from chapter 7 of Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, among thousands of persons, thousands of persons, one, strives for perfection. And if here, of course, he's talking about spiritual perfection. One. So among thousands, one will strive for perfection. And of those who strive and succeed, Krishna says, only one knows me in truth. So look at this. So thousands try, and of those few who's, who, who, who get, only a few know him for real. So it's a very tight pyramid. It's a very hard qualification process. And this is what, of course, you know, if you ask me, I've been doing this for 30 years, it's like, yeah, thousands of people. One is interested in a, in a channel like this and these teachings. And these, because people are just not interested. They just don't get it. They're like, they're just completely blind. You know, to use the language that you'll find in these Gnostic Gospels, they are drunk 
they have Jesus say, people are drunk and they have to shake off the wine. <laughs> you know, so they can, because they just don't get it. They're just not interested. They're just, boo, you know, that's exactly what's going on. So same idea, very uh, similar, you know, I like this parallel. Also with the Vedas, most people don't get it. Of course, the, 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 the Gnostic version was like, no, they can't get. They're just like, they're unable. They don't have the spark. You know, the, the Gita, the Vedic view is like, no, everybody could get it. They're just not interested right now because they're in Maya. But maybe, you know, they, some other lifetime they'll get it. But, you know, they're not getting it now. So that's it. So that's really interesting. Um, this is three parallels. And, you know, just to wrap it up, it's just, I mean, I love studying these things. And I think, you know, if you're into spirituality, especially if you're like you ever got into Christianity, you should certainly study these things. It's amazing to see how many, because I've done other videos here on these other Gnostic Gospels, how many different Christian traditions there were in the beginning, vastly different concepts. I mean, can you imagine? Here we have a whole Christian tradition that has nothing to do with belief in the cross and dying and resurrection. Zero it has nothing to do with that. It's fascinating. Then you have a whole, you know, the, the Christianity you know of, maybe you're practicing. The whole thing is based on the cross and you know, resurrection. And these other traditions, it's zero to that. Like, no, that's not the point at all. And they have, they have like scenes in these texts. So that's not me saying it. Don't get angry at me. They have scenes in these ancient gospels where Christ is laughing at people. Like saying, why are they they're focusing on the death? They're so stupid. It's my life that's important. You know, it's just like, you know, it's, which kind of makes sense, right? It's like, usually it's people's lives that are important, not their deaths. And it's the teachings. That's what is, and of course, if you understand anything like in any other spiritual tradition, religious tradition, it's usually like, it's if, you know, especially the Vedas, the Guru gives you teachings. You want to see what a person has to teach you. Now, you know, like, not what happens to them so much that's important, but what they teach. Even Krishna came, he did all these wonderful deeds, but, you know, then he taught Bhagavad Gita, and we taught Uddhava Gita. So we have, like, okay, that's what we focus on because we want to focus on his teachings of course we also focus on his deeds with the gopis so we get into the right rasa but it's the teachings which are really important so you know i re highly recommend that you don't just take for granted that the christianity that you've been given is like oh that's that's the one is that's exactly the one no study the tradition see how that was built up that was a construction that won the day, you know, won the market share, you know, through later through brute force as well. But it wasn't the only one. And so it, I think it's fascinating. Let me know if you enjoy this kind of topic. Leave your comments below and have your rest of your day with lots of peace and lots of love.